they wanted to know tips and tricks for your first brood inspection. So what I thought we'd do is go through that today by showing you actually how to do it while we talk about it. Last week we talked about it, but it's nice to have a practical example. So one of the first things we're gonna do is get your smoker going with nice, cool smoke. So, so we've, um, we've set fire to the hay in here. It's important that um, you, you uh, respect any fire danger issues. At some times of year, or if it's been particularly dry, you won't be allowed to light a smoker at all. So here it hasn't been, it's nice and wet, so we're not too concerned, but uh, do bear that in mind. And it's a nice idea to rest this on a metal lid if it's dry, like a garbage bin lid in front of the hive. So once you've lit it, you can keep puffing it till it's blowing nice, cool smoke. Bearing in mind that this can get quite hot as well as you close the lid. Now, once you've got it going, it's blowing nice cool smoke, you can actually put a little bit on your hands too. Although, you're probably going to be wearing your gloves for your first brood inspection. You can add a little bit more, top it up. You don't want it running out. I'm just using the garden mulch that I have available here. And if you've got questions, put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. Close the lid like that blowing nice cool smoke and what we want to do is put three good puffs into the entrance of the hive and you don't just want to go kind of out here you want to make sure you get the nozzle of the smoker right in the gap there three good puffs and then just leave it a minute or so and you can then rest the smoker somewhere near the entrance of the hive so as the bees return they're getting the waft of smoke, which will help calm them down. Now, if it's your first brood inspection, you probably don't have the super on yet, but that depends a bit on how you've started. Perhaps you've started by swapping from a conventional hive into a flow hive, in which case you might have the super on straight away if you have a big colony. This one, the super's been on for some time and have been working it, but you can't see any honey in the windows yet. So the first thing to do is just get a bit of an appraisal of your hive. Actually the first thing before going near the entrance of the hive is make sure you protect yourself. It's worth really protecting yourself and uh, making sure that you're staying nice and calm. So you don't need to be a hero and go and try and do it with no bee suit like you see some beekeepers doing. You want to make sure you're protected from stings. Okay, so the two zips go across in the middle. After the first one goes up, the two zips go across and then the flap goes down. And that just means it's unlikely that any bees can get through that joint there. Next, you've got your gloves. I'm not going to wear these, but I, if it's your food inspection, do wear your gloves. And as you get more comfortable and start to know your colony, you can experiment with not wearing gloves. So today we're doing your first brood inspection. We're going to run through it from start to finish and we're going to also answer questions if you've got questions. So the next thing to do if you've got a flow hive is take uh, unscrew these little wing screws here. They may be done up and may be holding your roof on. So there we go. So we may as well take the roof aside, that'll make it a little bit lighter to lift this box. Now, I've already established that there's not a lot of honey in this box, so I'm not too worried, but if you've got a box full of honey and it's really heavy, you might need to get some help to actually lift the super off the hive. You can see there, no honey showing yet, but the bees are working down the cells, joining up all the parts. Now. Another tip is take this piece off because it creates a nice handle here to lift the hive. Put that aside and you've got another handle on the other side. And just preparing yourself for the lift, it's much easier to lift if you're standing beside the hive because the weight's not so far out. So if you're standing this way, you can use this point as a lift point as well, then the weight's further out and it's just a bit heavier. Next is you're going to want somewhere to put it because underneath you've got a whole lot of bees clinging to, to the bottom and you don't want to squash them. So 
I've just uh, lined up the garden edge here where I can then put the hive down on an edge so the bees won't get squashed on the ground. But if you don't have that, then a brick or up against the lid or anything like that, just to lift it a bit off the ground. Next, we're going to, uh, we're going to take the whole super off in one go, which means I'll leave this inner cover on. I could take this off and start inspecting the flow frames as well, but today we're going to be going straight for the brood inspection. So you've got your chisel end of the tool, and that goes right under here like this. And it doesn't matter whether you're going above or below, but choose and do the same all the way around. What I meant by that is there's a black excluder here and it um, sometimes will stay with this box and sometimes will stay with this box. I'm gonna go underneath it and see if I can get it to stay with the top box, but I can already see along here that it's wanting to, to cling to the bottom. So I'm gonna change tactics, go above the excluder, there we go. I'm just levering up, I'm going to go around and do that on each corner. So again, I'm going to go above the excluder, I'm going to lever that up like that. I'm going to lever it up. Good. And what you're doing is just cracking some of the propolis that the bees have used to stick it all together. Now once you've done that, Again, keeping the weight towards you, you grab here and here and just rock back like this. Okay, and there's a bit of weight there. And uh, we just move that stand a little bit, just checking it's too strong. Looks like your, your queen excluder's coming a little bit. Apart. Wow, the actual bottom box is coming too. So that's what's happened. So I haven't loosened the excluder enough. It's still quite stuck, so that can happen. And you need to go around again. And this time I'm gonna go underneath it. That's it, now it's coming off. Now the longer it's left, the more stuck it'll be. And sometimes you can get the frames stuck to the excluder. You can see that here. If you have a, have a look in, and you actually need to lever them off. There we go. Now where were we? <laughs> That's good to show that. And now pulling it back towards you like this and find yourself a nice edge to put the box down on. And we'll just leave that there. There'll be a lot of bees that'll stay in there, which will be less bees that'll be bothering you while you're doing your brood inspection. Coming back up to the hive, the next thing is to peel off the excluder. Now, bearing in mind that the queen could be on the underside of it. So as we peel this off, we'll have a look for the queen. We don't want to orphan her from the hive. And you can see why it was stuck together. They've gotten busy and they've been building honeycomb between the excluder and the frames. It's a good sign, colony's nice and healthy. Look at that beautiful yellow wax. Okay, quick look for the queen. Can't see her, but just in case, we'll just lean that up against the hive so that she can walk back in. Sometimes she can't fly when she's in egg laying mode, but I definitely have seen her fly in egg laying mode. So some of the things you read in the bee books aren't actually um, true all the time. Adding a little smoke and choosing a frame to pull out now. You don't want to go for a really um, waxed in frame first because the first frame has to come directly upwards. And when it comes upwards, it, uh, you don't want it dragging all the bees between the comb surfaces or rolling the bees it's called. So I'm going to choose one that looks easy enough to get out, which is this one here. And uh, once we've got the first one out, the rest is easy. Okay, so a little bit of smoke. The bees will, will move away from that area. Look, we've got a, a big boy bee, a big drone there. Drones are nice ones to pick up and give to the children to play with because they don't have a stinger. The eyes touch together in the middle, you can see there. And uh, just 
bigger and teddy bear looking. Okay. Now, next I'm going to scrape away some of this burr comb because I don't want the burr comb to scratch the frame surface as I lift it up. To do that, you can use the chisel end of your tool and just scrape it away. We can even use the, uh, the J end of your tool as well. I'm just making some space so that the frame can come up without getting disturbed. Next, we wiggle it sideways a little bit. It's already nice and free, which is good. And JN goes under here. You lever it up. I'm going to hold that end and lever it up. Now, let's see. I'm going to come up nice and slow on the first frame. That's it. You're looking in watching this beautiful world appear before your eyes. I can see some drones. I can see a whole lot of worker bees. I can see some beautiful honeycomb. Look at that. If you did want to take some honeycomb home, you could definitely take some from this edge frame here. Beautiful, beautiful honeycomb. You can, you can actually take the bees off and just cut a piece out, take some away, and the bees will refill it again with their comb really quickly. It's one of the benefits of naturally drawn comb like this. There's no wires or foundation in there. So you can just um, cut some comb out if you want to. Now that I've got one frame out, I'm just going to lean that up against the hive. If you had your shelf brackets on the side, you could use that as a nice frame rest. Okay, now we can go sideways like this. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below. But here we are, it's your first brood inspection, so you don't need to do everything at once. Just keep it nice and slow and gentle. And if you're unsure of what's going on, don't try and do everything at once. Just slowly put it all back together again. Do some research, get some help, and uh, try again. That would be my tip. So the next one is coming up. Notice I didn't need to cut the burr comb away anymore. I'm going to leave that there. Oh, beautiful. Stone spotted the queen. Look at that. Beautiful. Just in front of my finger there is the queen. Notice she's got bigger strides as she walks. Nice, healthy looking queen. She's gotten a bit camera shy and looks like she's dived around the other side here. Some nice pollen bags on some of the bees. I'm seeing some drone brood, worker brood, young larvae. So at first glance, it's all looking pretty healthy. I'm also seeing a bee just emerging from its cell, just about to take its first steps inside the hive. And it's a worker bee, that I can tell by the eyes. And there it is, just chewing its way right out. Now one tip with the, your naturally drawn comb is not to tip it over too far sideways. This frame's nicely developed. There's the queen again, cruising around. This frame's uh, nice and, and stuck to the edges, so I can actually tilt this over sideways. But when they're fresh and weak still, and there's a, a lot of weight of honey, you don't want to do that. Beautiful, give us a thumbs up if you can see the queen. There she goes. Dived around the other side again. Hiding underneath. Okay. So what I might do is leave that one in the hive. It's got the queen on it. I don't want to orphan her from the hive. She's a very important bee. And there's usually only one laying queen in the hive. So we want to look after her, make sure she stays in the hive. Any questions?
Yeah, so to, um, people loving this, the live this morning and realising that um, when they take off their super and their queen excluder sticking, that they, we have the same sort of issue, so they're loving that. Okay, um, good. Yeah, it's, it's good. Just wondering how long, someone sort of said, I mean, you talked a little bit about it, about how long it takes to inspect, but can you leave the box open for too long? Is there, and also weather conditions, would like today here is obviously a beautiful day, Does it? Is that important as well? Today here is probably picture perfect as far as a day to, to inspect your brood, although a little bit too hot for me. I've got sweat dripping off my face. Uh, but it's a nice warm day. And what the ideal situation for bees in doing a brood inspection is mid-morning to mid-afternoon on a nice warm sunny day that's not too windy. Obviously you can't do that all the time and you have to pick and choose, but that's when the bees will be the calmest. Uh, in terms of leaving the brood open here it's a, it's a very warm day and we can we could leave it open for hours and it doesn't really matter if you if you're in a um, cold area or perhaps it's a really cold day then be careful with the open broods so when I say open brood I mean the cells there with larvae down the cells that you can see they can get a chill and die if it if they're left out for too long so if, if it is cold when you're doing brood inspections just make sure those frames aren't left out of the hive for too long you can still do your brood inspections, but just um, be mindful of how long you would um, leave the frames uh, out like this. Or you might choose the honey frame just to leave out of the hive and make sure the rest are, are staying in for the majority of the time. Great. And Cedar, will you, just a couple of things, wondering, will you clean off that wax on the top of the frames and also off the queen excluder, or will you just leave it all there? It does make it a bit easier to clean the wax off. It means next time, it may not stick to the excluder. However, you can just leave it there. There's some schools of thought that say it's a bit of a reservoir for the bees, the burr comb. Don't, don't uh, bother yourself by trying to clean it all the time. Just leave it there for the bees. So you could go either way, but if you do want it a bit easier to pop up next time, this is how you clean it. You, you add a bit of smoke until the bees have vacated the area. And then uh, you don't need like big bellows of smoke, just a few little puffs, and then you can get along there with your chisel and just scrape it off like this. If it's got honey in it, you don't want to leave it outside the hive. If it's got no honey like that, you can, you, you can scrape it off, or you can keep that for, for candle making. But you want to be careful if you scrape off some of these bits like this bit here with honey in it, to um, not leave it behind on the ground or bees will get a taste for honey and start robbing. So that one there, see how that wax has got honey? You want to make sure you keep that to chew on and not leave around for bees to suck on because who knows, this hive could have pathogens, other hives could suck on that and then you're spreading them around. And Cedar, what's the difference between that and burr comb? Or is it the same? Uh, this burr comb, brace comb, it's all honeycomb really. I wouldn't get too worried about the technicalities of it, but um, basically uh, the, the wax that they put not on the frames all around is stuff that you can um, then scrape off if you want to. Okay. Great, we've got um, some people joining us from Canada where it's absolutely dead of winter, they're absolutely freezing there. Well. I know, <laughs> complete opposite to us here. In Australia, so wondering too the, how the flow hives go in such cold climates. Okay, wonderful. Isn't it amazing? You've got beekeepers all around the world. Some, you know, knee deep in snow. Other ones, just uh, dripping in sweat. And here we are, just all tuning in, learning bees together. It's fantastic. So we have um, we have hives in in the cold climates in Canada. We have them even in Norway. We have them in Europe. And the, the hives are fine, right? These are, these are European honeybees that are these amazing little pollinators that humans have dragged around the world with them. So they're really used to that cold, long winter. And as long as they've got enough honey stores, they've got a really good chance of surviving the winter. Whether it be a flow hive or a conventional hive, it's all the same as far as looking after your bees and getting them through that winter time. Then in the summer, it's a warm time, so you'll find harvesting the honey from your flow frames will be, might not be as warm as this, but it'll be pretty warm and the honey will flow nicely. And even when it's really cold, 
around um, around zero degrees, you can still get the honey to flow because the bees ca keep the hive warm. Their brood nest, they keep it about 35 degrees C. And uh, that warmth flows up and keeps the honey warm as well. So yes, flow hives work in cold climates. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. We've got plenty of examples of beekeepers who uh, have their hives in snow and then harvesting beautiful flow hive honey as the season progresses. Does it see to, um, Sandra saying, wondering, are you immune to bees, that you can do this without your gloves on? Look, I'm not immune to bees, but I've been around them a lot and I've, and I've learnt to tell when they're starting to get a bit grumpy. And when they're getting a bit grumpy, I will put my gloves on because I don't enjoy stings that much. But uh, it is much nicer to work just with your hands with no gloves on. So as you progress as a beekeeper, you'll probably progress to the point where you're experimenting with not having your gloves on. Having said that, just um, you make sure that, that you're okay with bee stings before you go and get a lot of them. You don't want to um, suddenly realise you've, you've got severe allergic reactions when you're getting a lot of stings at once, I guess. We've also got first aid links on our website that you should have a look at. So careful, careful, wear your gloves in the beginning, get used to your hive, get used to beekeeping, get used to even stings before you start going gloveless. Great, Chuck's asking and he's in very, very cold weather. Just wondering if he's got to do an emergency um, feeding on his bees, any tips for that? Emergency feeding, yeah. okay. I did make a video once called How to Make a Quick and Dirty Feeder, which basically uh, was a few d different styles of feeders you can put right under the lid of your hive. Now, if um, you have a look down here, there's, there's an area where you can create a feeder. Um, you can take uh, that cap out, you can put an upside down jar with some sugar syrup in it. If you're wanting them to store, then you could go two parts, um, you could make a fairly thick syrup, which is two parts sugar to one part water. Cook that up on the stove, let it cool down, put it in a jar, put some holes in the lid of the jar, and place it upside down on here with that cap out. And that will provide a feed for the bees to start storing if they're getting really hungry. In an emergency, you can also do dry sugar feeding, which is where you pull out a comb and just sprinkle some uh, dry sugar right into the honeycomb. And the bees can also use that. Another method is a Ziploc bag with, with sugar syrup in it. You place it on top here. That's a march fly, not a bee. <laughs> and uh, put some pinholes in it and the bees will come up and suck the honey out of the pinholes of the Ziploc bag. That works quite well as well. So there, there's a few ways you can make a quick feeder. You can either put the lid right on top of that or if you're using a tall jar, another brood box and then the lid on top of that again. But as I said, there is a video there that you will find. And if you tune in on the beekeeper.org, we've also got uh, a, a very extensive bee course if you're really wanting to sink your teeth into, into um, beekeeping and, and get a deep scientific and practical knowledge of beekeeping. You can have a look at that online course with experts from all around the world contributing. Okay, Fantastic. so let's uh, keep going here. We were cleaning a bit of burr comb. We were looking at the frames. Now, this video is titled Your First Brood Inspection. Don't feel like you have to do it all at once. But uh, after the, the hive's been open for, say, half an hour or so, you're going to want to just start the process of closing it back up. Here we are, the bees still seem fine. We're gonna keep going, keep answering questions. Topping up your smoker is a good idea. When it goes out, it can be a bit disruptive to the process of doing your inspections. So what I'm gonna do is just grab a bit more mulch, throw it right in here. Bear in mind that the metal of the smoker will be hot. And what, so what sort of mulch are you using there, Cedar? This is actually a sugarcane mulch that uh, Trace has mulched the garden with here and uh, it works fine, but I just use whatever you have on hand, bark from a tree, pine needles work really good, any old hay, just something that's dry. 
You can add a bit of grass on top if you want to cool down the smoke as it comes out. Some people do that, just a bit of green grass. Then get your smoker going again. And now that it's all very hot, I'm gonna use my J tool to close the lid and push it down. Perfect, and Cedar, are there any things that maybe you shouldn't use in your smoker? Uh, I wouldn't use anything that's going to have chemical smells to it. So you don't want to use like um, magazine paper, for instance, because it's got a whole lot of toxic chemicals to make that print. Um, so yeah, just bear in mind with that sort of thing. Um, you just want to keep it nice and organic. Some grass mulch, some, some leaves, pine needles, anything like that. Some people even use cow dung. Dried cow dung. Cow dung? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I guess that's kind of grass mulch in it a way. Is, isn't it? Yeah. Nice. Nice smell of cow. Cedar, so um, Caleb's saying that when they're, that these bees look really calm, and I know we get this comment a lot about the bees, um, our bees here at the apron. Just wondering when, when, when they're doing their inspection, their bees get really upset. Okay. Any tips on that, or is it just a matter of using your smoker? So if they're really upset, don't be afraid to use the smoker a lot. Give them a lot of smoke. Um, if they're really, really upset bees and they're just too aggressive to work with at all, there's even uh, tricks you hear of people doing where they, um, where they. Uh, actually close the hive up and uh, whack the side of the hive and the bees get all agitated and they repeat that process over an hour or so and the bees kind of, they lose their agitation after a while and then you can open them up again and they're supposedly calmer. However, I haven't tried that first hand so <laughs> I wouldn't suggest whacking your hive uh, before <laughs> inspecting. Um, but uh, ultimately it's genetics that cause that. So if you want a really calm hive like this, then you might think about buying in a queen from a queen breeder and swapping it out. If that feels too daunting, then get somebody experienced with bees to help you do that process. And then a month later, you'll have nice calm bees because the queen holds the genetics from uh, herself and the drones she's mated with, and she only mates at the start of her life. In, in the first week and she's got the genetic material which will determine the temperament of the hive for the life of that queen which could be up to six years so it could be an idea to change the queen if you don't want the aggression however if you can handle it you can put up with it then you and they're not causing any bothers to, to neighbors or, and, and things like that then by all means just um, keep going and wear your gloves wear your suit and uh, look after yourself and decide whether it's necessary to requeen or not. Right, Cedar, so just a couple of people missed the name of the course that you were talking about okay. that, that we're offering. The beekeeper.org. So it's an initiative yeah. that we started with uh, getting experts from all over the world to, to share their knowledge. And it's also a fundraiser, raising funds for habitat regeneration and protection. Uh, and advocacy for bees. So, so it's a great thing and there's some amazing um, pieces on there. Amazing video content, very high quality training material. And actually, somebody asked the question on Facebook the other day, you know, what's this course, is it worthwhile doing? And I was so happy that there was a mile long thread of people saying how wonderful the course was and they would highly recommend it. It was really hard to find any negative comments at all, which is so unusual online. Usually online you get ripped apart no ma matter what you do, so the course must be okay. <laughs> um, Simon's asking, in Adelaide, put his brood, the brood box was full, put the super on about six weeks ago, but there doesn't seem to be much action happening in the super. Um, any tips on that? Okay. The, the recipe for action in the super is a lot of bees and a lot of nectar available and when those two things align you'll get uh, quite quick activity in the super as your bees really build up and starting to store but you can get the case where it's really slow like this super actually went on um, some months ago and it's not full yet it, they've waxed it up and they've prepared it but they haven't actually um, stored any simply because there hasn't been enough available really to store much honey in that super if they're not 
uh, starting at all and you're getting a bit impatient, then then getting a bit of this um, burr comb like this is a, is a perfect thing to do. It doesn't have to have any honey in it, just the wax. And just press that into the flow frame surface. Do it in the window where you can watch it and you'll be able to watch the bees recycle that wax and start their work on the flow frames. And that can be a way just to get a little bit of action a little bit quicker. And that's the way I'd recommend if you, if you want to speed things up. People talk about putting sugar water and things. I haven't found that to help at all. The bees just lick it off and get back to what they were doing. But wax, um, they'll see that and go, that's in the wrong spot. I better redistribute that in a nice comb pattern. So um, that's a good tip there. Great. This is a this is a good question. This is from Chris. Um, we've got a few frames of drone comb. Um, will the bees recycle the comb to make more workers in the future, or once drone comb, is it always drone comb? Uh, generally, it'll stay as that size for quite some time till the bees tear it down for some reason. So uh, it's it's not a bad thing to have drone comb and bees also make drone sized cells to store honey. If you have a look at some of these cells here, these are actually drone sized cells, about six millimeters instead of the 5.3 millimeters of worker comb. So when they're, when they're deciding to use it for honey only and not brood, they, they will make the bigger cells too. So as you cycle that comb out towards the edge of the hive, which is a good thing to do as the seasons go on, get some of the older comb from the center, move it out to the edges, let all the brood emerge, let it all become honey, and then you can take it out of the hive altogether. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. I'd let the bees decide what they want to do. And uh, if you do want to cycle it out, move it towards the edge in preparation for that. That's fantastic. The difference between the size of the combs. Chuck's even just put a little posted a video on the maths of beekeeping that was on the beekeeper.org. Ah, nice one. <laughs> um, Aaron from Belfast. Hi Aaron. Just wondering, can you have more than one queen bee in a hive? It certainly happens where you get more than one queen bee and I've seen it before but it's, it's a bit unusual. It's when they're in a bit of a changeover that that's happening. So, uh, But generally there's one laying queen per hive. Now, unless you're trying to do a multi-queen hive, which is a fun thing to experiment with, and some beekeepers um, on a commercial level do multi-queen hives to get more production out of each hive. Uh, so to do a multi-queen hive, what you need to do is have a, a, a brood box with a queen in it, a queen excluder, then one or more honey supers, which is the box for collecting honey, then another queen excluder, and then another brood box on top. So you end up with these tall stacks. And what can happen is the pheromones aren't strong enough uh, between the, the top and the bottom for the bees to knock off the queen. Um, so what happens is you get common honey supers where there's bees from two different queens all meshing together and uh, working the same supers. So that can be a cool thing to to experiment with, but generally it's one queen per hive. Great, um, Jake from Western Australia has got a couple of questions. One is just, just saying, see that the, the hives that we have don't look like they are on a lean, and uh, do you only put them on a lean when they're harvesting? Uh, th this actually is on a lean, it's got a three degree slope backwards, but once you're out of your home and you've got it away from square, uh, square things, you don't really notice anymore. And if you have a look at this level here, the level bubble is set in the middle. And that level bubble on the side, is, it, when it's in the centre, is the good honey harvesting angle of about three degrees backwards. And we did that because people were having trouble getting the hives set up on the right slope. So that's another little feature of the flow hive too. And there's a, there's a level at the back also, which um, gives you the sideways level, which you actually want totally level for building natural comb. Right, and his other question, Cedar from Jake, was I'm not sure how many frames he was harvesting, but he's saying he got a bit of honey in his tray. Um, any, any way to prevent this from happening? Okay, the answer is not really. Um, if you're harvesting all your frames at once, some of them are probably pretty likely to have a bit of a spill, just depending on how the bees have capped their, their honey 
and the dynamics and viscosities of honey across the frame as well. So um, the, the bees will lick up any, any inside the hive. If there's too much, it'll go through, as you say, to the tray, which is outside the hive. So you, you can uh, just clean that up and put the tray back in again. Here you can see some beautiful brood, if you want to see what that looks like. If I, if I give these bees a little bit of a nudge, you can see what brood looks like. It's, the, the capping is a bit less transparent and it's nice when you get a lot of brood like this because everyone is a new bee waiting to emerge in the hive. They spend 11 days in that cocoon phase with their capping on and so in the next 11 days all of those cells that you see will be new bees in the hive. So we should see a nice population explosion in this hive as all of this brood emerges. It's beautiful. Up here is the honeycomb just to get your eye in. And it takes a little while. That's honeycomb there. A little bit more transparent on the capping and that's the brood there. That's the worker brood, where as the drone brood sticks out a little bit like a bullet shapes. Let me see if I can find any to show you. Uh, it st sticks out because the bees are a little bit bigger. I think perhaps back on this previous frame we had. Now, Nice and gentle on your first time beekeeping, doing your brood inspection. It's really slow, slow movements. Try and stay calm. If you find yourself getting a bit flustered, just walk away for a little bit. Get your smoker out, give them some more smoke and come back again. Here's the queen here. She's jumped across to this frame. There she is there. Look at that. Give me the thumbs up if you can see that with the screen resolution. She's got a longer abdomen. She's usually not so striped and she takes bigger strides and that's often the way you see her is by her movements a bit, bit bigger strides than the rest of the bees. She's a bit, bit skitty. Sometimes she'll just go about her business laying and things but this queen is uh, a little bit camera shy. Now I was looking for some drone brood. Let's see if we can find any to show you. I'm not seeing any here. There's a queen cup and you'll find them on the bottom and they're doing that in case they need to raise a new queen. And you can have a look inside. It's just an empty queen cup so there, there is no larvae inside that. Some beekeepers will knock them off they don't want a new queen to be raised and swarming activity to, to happen. Uh, and it's something they do in the springtime as a, a swarm prevention technique. The best thing I find is just to give them some new area to lay in. Beautiful, we've got time for a, a few more questions. Cedar, um, if, you've got a, if you get a nucleus of bees and the frames look a bit old, uh, the question is, should, should you swap them out or just keep them? And if you should swap them out, when should you do that? Okay, so just put them in your hive, work with them. Let the, uh, it will be typical for them to be a bit old because they're a split off a, off a hive that's, uh, that actually has some age to it. They're a big hive. They might have multiple brood boxes and have taken some of the frames out. So that's pretty normal. What you'll be doing is adding more frames to that. So if you've got, uh, uh, if you've got the Flow Hive 6, which has eight brood frames, then you'll be adding, uh, there's usually five frames in the nuke. So you'll be adding three more to it. So they'll have plenty of fresh ones to work with. And then over time, you can cycle out those dark ones by moving them towards the edges of the hive and then out of the hive altogether, replacing with fresh ones. Or if they're foundationless, you can cut the cut the old comb out right in the field and put the frame straight back in. Right, Matt, Matt's asking that they did an inspection and they, they're thinking that they may have some capped brood in their super flow frames. Any tips on that or how that may have happened? Okay, so there's a couple of reasons why that could happen. The most common one is you don't have a queen below and the workers are starting to lay eggs all around the hive. So check that 
get down below, check you've got brood. If you haven't got any brood below, you may not have a queen. The other one is uh, a young virgin queen can slip through an excluder sometimes and end up in the honey super. And then she's stuck in that area and she can't get back down. And if that's the case, where you've got um, worker brood emerging from your flow frames, um, in any case, just to make sure, shake all the bees downstairs, back down to the brood box, put your excluder on and put your flow frames back on. So you'll be pulling out each flow frame, shaking and, and brushing with some foliage or a bee brush the, the bees off to make sure uh, if there is a queen in the top that she's being moved down to the bottom and put your excluder back on. You need to get back in there and make sure you do have a laying queen though. Sometimes the workers will be laying drones, as said, all around the hive and your hive will slowly die out if that's the case. You'll need to rectify that by giving them a new queen or the resources to do so with some eggs and brood from another frame, another hive. Right. Sita, how much, if you're preparing for winter, this was someone in, Northern, in New South Wales actually, wondering how much honey do you know to leave um, in the super for your bees over winter? Okay, that question is best answered by your local bee club or your local bee experts. Do get more than one opinion. I have been in a very southern area here in Australia, in Tasmania, where uh, one beekeeper would swear that if you didn't have two ten frames of honey to survive the winter, your bees would die. Around the corner, somebody would set up exactly like this with just an eight frame uh, hive and a single super saying no problem, they'll survive through the winter. So you get different schools of th thought, different types of management, different experiences, and everybody's answer is correct for the experience they had, and it's up, up to you to, uh, to uh, gain a few opinions and make up your mind on what you need to do. But uh, generally, you want it a, a, in those cold places where you even get snow, you're gonna need at least a box of honey for them to survive through the, the what could be uh, up to six months of um, very cold weather with no flowers. So if, if they don't have enough stores, you'll need to feed them, preferably prior to winter, to build up some stores. And you'll be feed, feeding them a, a thick syrup, a two to one, uh, two parts sugar, one part water, and they will store that in the cells um, as if it were honey. Honey's better from flowers, obviously, but if, if it's a case of starvation, then feed your bees. So, uh, and if, if you've missed the boat and it's halfway through winter and you realise the boxes, they're out, then you'll also need to feed them. So um, a few tips there. We're lucky here in the subtropics, there's flowers all winter. We don't really have that issue at all. We do get months, you know, sometimes a couple of months with very low nectar flow, but there's always something for the bees so we don't have to worry about that um, overwintering it gets cold. Right, and Cedar, if, with brood frames, should, I'm not sure if you answered this before with um, the other question, but someone's saying sometimes their brood frames go really black, do they need to swap those out? And, or can you just leave the brood frames in there f as long as you like? Is there? Uh, you can uh, leave the brood frames in there for, um, Generally, it's advised to start swapping them out after they've been in for a couple of seasons. So uh, you want to get rid of the pathogen load a bit and give them some nice fresh wax. And generally, you do that by your swarm uh, prevention in spring by giving them some extra space to lay in. So what you do is you cycle some out from the edge and put some fresh ones back in the centre. If you do that each spring, you're recycling a few, few frames out each season, giving them some nice fresh ones. Here's another frame of brood. It's seeing um, some waggle dancers on the comb surface too, which is super cool. It's amazing that bees in a dark hive, in amongst 50,000 bees, can communicate to the point of telling really accurate information of where to go to get the flowers, to get the pollen and the nectar. It's uh, extraordinary. And you can actually learn to decode that. If you look up the waggle dance, you will be able to learn by watching the bees how far they're going and in which direction, which is amazing. And we've got so much more to learn, of course, as well. 
So, so uh, as you get more experience, you're really looking at the frame, trying to check for anomalies. If I was seeing a really patchy brood pattern with not much brood here, I'd start to worry that the queen was failing a bit or they had some disease issues. And you'd be shaking some bees off the frames and having a really good look at it. To shake bees off a frame, you'd give it a short, sharp shake like this, right above the hive, because if the queen's there, you want it to go back into the box. Now you can get a good look at the surface of the comb and what you're looking for is sunken dark capping with a piercing in it. If you see that, you might have an issue such as AFB or EFB. Always be on the lookout for it. Some areas it's quite uh, prevalent and you want to make sure that it's not getting away in your apiary. Here's a very young baby bee. You can see that's just emerged by the way. She's just waddling and she's kind of furry white color as well. Lots, lots of hairs, hasn't taken any flights yet, probably hasn't done much at all apart from wander out and take a few steps and go, wow, what's this massive mammal staring in at me? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. We actually got one just emerging here. If you can see there, chewing away. Just chewing away, chewing away. In 10 minutes or so, she will have emerged into the hive ready to do some of her first chores, which are uh, cleaning the cells the bees come out of, preparing them for new eggs, and then there's a myriad of things to do inside the hive, from building comb, to uh, feeding the larvae is one of the first jobs, to uh, undertakers pulling out the dead, and eventually in the last half of their life, if it's foraging season, they'll get to go out of the hive, do their orientation flights, lock onto where the hive is with amazing accuracy, and then fly up to 10 kilometers to get flowers after watching a dance inside the hive, telling them where to go. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. No rest for the bees. So the minute they're born, they are sent to work. They are. They are busy bees. That's where the term comes from. <laughs> we see some pollen down these cells as well. It's amazing we get to marvel in on this world and watch as another bee emerging over here. There's some pollen down the cells. You can see that one just, um, just chewing its way out there. Little, little antennae sticking out of the cells, getting run over by a million bees at the same time. It's all happening. Seva, so on a previous um, inspection you did, you cut out a heart-shaped um, piece of honeycomb. Could you take some honeycomb out of this hive? Absolutely. So it's quite a, quite a nice thing to do. So here's a, here's a frame here. The bees have mainly vacated it by themselves, which is lovely. All you'd have to do is flick off the last little bees like this, and then you could cut out some beautiful honeycomb. We could do it now if we had a knife and a plate, and the bees would actually just fill that back in again quite quickly. So it's a fine thing to do. Typically, the frames on the edge of the hive are full of honey, and if you want some honeycomb, then get in there and get some. The bees will hardly miss a section out of here and uh, you can enjoy that, put it on a cheese plate with some blueberries and things like that mm. and take it to the next party and you'll be very popular. <laughs> ben. <laughs> Look at that, it's a oh, beautiful thing. That. that is so beautiful. So we're going to put this hive back together now and get out of this very hot Australian sun. Stay okay. Now camera person is doing amazingly well with the camera in the heat and his full suit on. Yes, sometimes we have overheating issues with the equipment. Having overheating issues with my brain at the moment I think too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just as we do this we've got time for one more question. But let's show you how to put the hive back together as well. So, one of the questions, Cedar, and it gets a lot asked actually on customer support as well, is how many bees are in the hive? Okay, so my guess in this one, it's not a, not a, a super busy hive yet, is there's about 20,000 bees in here, which is an extraordinary number, but a really pumping big hive can have 50,000 bees in it, which is amazing. But if you think about what they need to do in terms of honey production and really storing, is each bee might only bring in a quarter of a teaspoon of honey. But a hive with 50,000 bees, if half of them go out to the flowers, 
and, and visit a couple of thousand flowers, there's 50 million flowers that, uh, that could be visited in one day. So it's the sheer numbers and the amazing hard workers that they are that enable that incredible honey production that you see when things align can fill up boxes in a week and that's just incredible. You also get some seasons which you don't get any honey at all so it's all a bit of a spectrum. I'm going to slide this back in and I'm going to try and do it in the same fashion that it came out because what you want to avoid is areas where the bees didn't get to, uh, can't actually service the comb. So I'm looking at this going if I put it in this way this comb surface and that comb surface is bulged out and we don't want that because if this comb touches that comb the bees can't service it and the beetles could choose that area to lay eggs and the bees couldn't stop them. So let's go the other way around. Sometimes the burr comb helps you work that out too. I can see this little bit of burr comb goes with that little bit there and that's a neat way to work out which way the comb goes back in. So there's an argument for not scraping off all the burr comb. Sliding back down gently, making sure that last drop where it goes into the hive, there isn't a bee under the end bar. There you have it. The, the frames are all back in. Make sure they're all pressed close together and any spare space is on the edges of the hive. That way you'll get less random comb uh, being built between the frames because bees are very specific about their distance uh, and they want their frames to be spaced correctly. So you can push them together. Next we're going to put that uh, queen excluder back on, which we left over here. You could give that a, a clean if you wanted to, and that might make it easier next time. So to do that, you can. Uh, it's best if you can rest that on a surface where you can really give it a scrape, but let's have a go here like this, and we'll just scrape it off. And uh, you can keep that wax for making candles with your kids. So you know, how often would you inspect your brood box once you've put your super on? Uh, it's, um, the requirements differ across the world of what you need to do and as a new beekeeper I'd recommend really getting in there each month and just checking it out and learning a lot because that's what it's all about. You don't want to become a beekeeper that act, is too scared to, to work with your bees. One, you're missing out on the amazing adventures of exploring the world from your own backyard. But you're, you're also uh, also potentially going to miss if the bees have an issue and you won't get the chance to rectify that. So I'd get in there, start learning and start in inspecting your brood. Now at the minimum would be in this country you'd want to be doing a proper brood inspection, shaking all the bees off, looking for AFB and things at least a couple of times a year. But it's good to do it more than that. In other areas of the world we've got uh, We've got um, things like Varroa mite which might need a management solution which might mean pulling apart the hive and doing sugar shakes and so on. So the, you will need to find out from your local beekeepers what the, um, what the requirements are for you um, both from a legal point of view uh, and also from a point of view of just looking after your bees. But it's not like chickens where you have to be there every day to lock the door and make sure they're happy and safe. You can go away for months at a time and your bees are okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is add a little smoke around the edge because I want to choose a, a moment here where there isn't any bees around the edge to put this excluder on. I'm going to do that right now. While there's no bees on that edge, the smoke just uh, moved them away. And then before the bees really get up and populate the area of the excluder, I'm going to lift up this hive here, which is starting to realise it's missing its um, missing its the rest of its bees, and we're going to put it actually the other way around, <laughs> like this. Make sure there's no bees in the way, and we're just going to line that up, drop that on, and uh, there we have it. You've got your super back in place. Don't forget to put the covers back on. So we've got, we've got, uh, you can leave any bees on the outside of the hive just to work their way around to the entrance again. These covers go on like this. 
and important to make sure you keep your window covers on you don't want sun shining into your hive heating it, it up too much and then your roof for a bit more protection a bit more insulation stopping that heat beating down on your hive thank you very much for watching and all of your great questions if you'd like us to cover something in particular put it in the comments below otherwise We'll be back next week with uh, another interesting episode. Don't forget to clean up the honey you've left on the ground. It's really not a good idea to leave any honeycomb around or you will be uh, promoting robbing and sharing of pathogens. So be responsible. Take that away. Take the, the, the wax away even in case it's...